want to thank you all for joining us today for worship. It is the third, three candles, right? Third, can third Sunday in the season of Advent as we prepare for Christmas. Christmas is coming. It's just around the bend, two weeks from today, in fact. Uh, I hope your preparation is going well. I'm hoping that you're taking ample time for devotional reflection because that is truly the purpose of this season. It's not about running like mad and doing all the Christmas things. Christmas starts December 25th. Don't worry about doing Christmas things until the start of Christmas, December 25th. Then you've got 12 days to watch all the Christmas movies and do all of those types of things. Right now, we dedicate ourselves to preparing our hearts to meet Christ anew on that Christmas day. Reminder that we are still in the season of prayer, and so we invite you to our Tuesday prayer service. You can either join us live in person, or you may join us at 7 p.m. online. We do a 15-minute time of prayer as a congregation, but I'm asking you to continue to dedicate yourself to that time of prayer every single day. Pray for this congregation, for its pastor, for its leaders, and for the community as well. We ask that you do so because we, again, are trying to lay the appropriate foundation for the next 100 years of our congregation. A few other announcements. I think most of them now are on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, you will have seen many of them about Christmas. We have two Christmas Eve services, 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. You're welcome to come in any of those services. There are no uh, reservation requirements this year. You're welcome to just come. Pick a service, come when you'd like to come. Uh, there are no mask requirements except for this. If you are sick, in fact, our, our guy doing our tech, Johnny, today has his mask on. Why? Because Johnny's been a little ill, a little under the weather. And I have such massive respect for that. Um, I pray that you would do the exact same thing when uh, you are feeling a little under the weather. Put a mask on. We have them available for you in the sanctuary. You're welcome to grab them and wear them and be respectful of those who are wearing them. Sometimes they are doing so because they feel like they're a little at risk. And uh, so just keep your distance. Be respectful of that. That's all we're asking. But otherwise, you're welcome to come and join us for Christmas. We also have Christmas Day service at 930. We will not have a 1045 service Christmas Day, only 930. A week from today, December the 18th, we will have a big packaging box party, packaging the boxes that we'll be delivering to the neighbors in the community who need some help with food for Christmas. I would love it if you would come down. That's going to take place immediately following our 9.30 a.m. service. And so we invite you to join us for that. We still need some hams. We need some corn, canned corn, canned beans. We need uh, some bread. We don't need eggs anymore. So if you're thinking about going out and grabbing eggs, we had a wonderful uh, woman connected with the congregation delivered us a ton of eggs, and we're so thankful for that. And we're looking forward to be able to distribute those to the people in the community. So please get uh, some of those things if you'd like to contribute. But if you're able to help out, you'd like to package boxes, that's again at 10 o'clock a week from today. If you'd like to deliver boxes, let me know as well, too. I'm done with my talkie-talkie. We're here to worship God, and so I'm inviting you to prepare hearts. Since this is, again, the season of Advent, we do light three candles today as a third day. In many traditions, they use a pink candle, hence the candle of joy. It is a time and day of celebration. So let us prepare hearts. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Today we remember an innocent and powerful, sacred and scared, worried and waiting young woman named Mary as she waited for the Savior of all who was growing within her womb. She sings boldly today when she might have been meek. She bears her role in history with great confidence, the confidence of a warrior. She's the beginning of a mighty revolution as the proud are brought down and the lowly are lifted up. 
Today we give thanks for the Marys amongst us, those pioneers determined to do as God asks us, fearless and fearfully stepping out in faith and beckoning us to do the same. On this, the third Sunday of Lent, Advent, we light a candle as a symbol of Mary, Mother of God, Bearer of the Way. Let us sing together our opening hymn. We will sing a hymn today. Hark, a thrilling voice is sung. Stir up the wills of all who look to you, Lord God, and strengthen our faith in your coming, that, transformed by the grace, we may walk in your way, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first lesson for today is found in the book of James, the fifth chapter. James writes, Come, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted you, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasures in the wrong place. Listen, the wagers of labor who mowed your fields, which have been kept by fraud, cry out, Cry out against the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord. You have lived on earth in luxury and pleasure. You have fattened yourself in your hearts for the day of, in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous, the one who does not resist you. But for those 
laborers, be patient. Therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord, for the farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives receives the earthly, early and late rains, you also must be patient, strengthened in your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Beloved, do not grumble, so that you may not be judged. As an example of suffering and patience, our Lord, beloved, showed us. Take the prophets also, who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who showed endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and have seen his purpose, and the purposes of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, beloved, do not swear either by heaven or earth. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, so you might not fall under condemnation. Here ends the lesson. Let us read responsibly the psalm for today. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked, looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the, the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from the thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has held his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Sunday is found in the book of Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, you Lord. Lord. So when John heard, went, heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, and he sent word by his disciples and said to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go, tell John what you have heard and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them. Blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. So as the disciples of John went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look. Those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. So what then did you go and see? A prophet? <laughs> yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. Truly I tell you, amongst those born of women, no one has arisen that is greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this word, and may it strengthen us and embolden us in our faith towards you and relationship towards one another, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, for those online, you uh, do have available to you a handout for today's service, and it is again attached to the announcement for today's service as a, as a common, the comment section is entitled, Do, Doubt is not a lack of faith. I know you've been taught that in churches. You probably have told that to people or have had that told to you. Stop doubting. That's a lack of faith. Jesus says, do not doubt. But every time Jesus says, do not doubt, it is under a very particular set of circumstances. It is not never doubt. It's in this particular circumstance. Don't fear. Don't doubt. 
Okay, so that's important. But we are going to run into a guy named John today who doubted a great deal and I think had justifiable reason for doing so. So let's remind you of the context of this. Who is John? John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, who was preaching and preparing the way for the Messiah that was to come. He had a, an experience with this Messiah who came to be baptized by John. John had been preaching and proclaiming for about a year before he was then imprisoned. While in prison, there for four months, by the way, he spent four months in prison before he was ultimately executed, it did not end well for John. John began to doubt because he heard reports about what Jesus was proclaiming and preaching. So John, you see, illustrates one response that we have to Jesus. See, you can respond to Jesus by completely rejecting Jesus. That's the opposite of faith. Or you can question, you can doubt. John the Baptist was doubting. That's a common response when one connects with or hears about the good news of Jesus. He's beginning to doubt, and I'll tell you why he's doubting. His, when what he heard about Jesus and what Jesus is preaching does not align with John's expectations of what he thought the Messiah should be and should be doing. And so that's the reason why he's wondering if Jesus was the right, right one or not. Because John sat there and said, I'm not even worthy of untying this guy's sandals. Well, maybe I was wrong. Maybe Jesus isn't the guy. So he had reservations about Jesus. And here's the reason why. All those wonderful wonders and miracles, the miracles that Jesus was performing, did not align with his vision of what the Messiah should be doing. He said, Jesus is wasting his time healing sick people when he should be out raising an army to overthrow the government, okay? What's he doing wasting his time with that? He also heard that Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors and sinners, the wrong crowds of people, the social outcasts. John the Baptist would not be caught dead in a bar or anywhere where there were social outcasts. That was not the way of John. He was also concerned because Jesus had proven himself to be very undisciplined as demonstrated by his hard partying ways. Yes, Jesus was a hard partying fella. Do you remember the wedding at Cana in Galilee? Where he actually made more wine for all the drunk guests? So he heard these stories about Jesus going to all these parties. And he's like, how does that align with what the Messiah is supposed to do? So John wants to confront Jesus with his expectations and say, Jesus, what gifts? Why aren't you acting in the way that I expected the Messiah to act? But what Jesus says, he says to John's disciples, take this message back. And let me read to you this message, because it's a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 61. Jesus, remember, began his ministry quoting from this. Go report to John what you hear and see, Jesus said. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the good news preached to them. That is just fantastic, isn't it? What Jesus, in essence, is saying is, John, you're only reading a portion of the book of Isaiah. You're not reading it all and taking it all, and you've missed the parts that talk about how the Messiah would come and do these things. Notice one thing. Jesus is never harsh to John. He never criticizes John. He never says, John, you need to stop doubting. He never sends word back to him in that way. John is doubting, but his doubt is reasonable. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Again, what's the opposite of faith? The opposite of faith is atheism. Okay? Anti-theism. Not doubt. So stop saying that doubt is somehow in conflict with faith. faith doubt is not a sign of weakness either. The greatest and strongest of men, John the Baptist himself, doubted. Jesus doubted. 
We see that in the scripture as well, too. We doubt oftentimes because we do not see the plan, the entire plan that God has in store for us. We often doubt because the reality of what we're experiencing does not match our expectations. We doubt because we're often asked to risk everything as John the Baptist was. And we doubt whether or not it was worthwhile. So therefore, doubt is a reasonable thing. It's a sign of sanity. If you walk through your life without any doubt, I worry about you. Because sometimes you might come to a big crashing pile, uh, a wreck at the end of your life. You should be asking at some point, is the cause for which I've been asked to give my life, Jesus, worthy of my giving of my life. Is Jesus worthy? You're not going to go to hell for asking that question. You should ask that question. Is Jesus worthy of my life? Now I hope in the end you'll get a yes to that. But it's a reasonable question to ask that any sane person should ask at some point in their journey, their walk with God. As John's disciples leave, they're walking away, and Jesus says the following word, uh, Blessed is he, verse 6, who does not take offense at me. A better way to say that is, does not get tripped up by me. Does not get tripped up by the way I look and dress and the type of people with whom I interact. Jesus' ministry should be evaluated by its content, not its style. He preaches the good news to the poor, and that was a great offense to the scribes and Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day. But don't judge him based on that, because God has always said that was the purpose of the Messiah. People were looking for a political liberator who would overthrow the government. That's not what Jesus did. Don't judge me on the basis of that. Rather, what Jesus was doing was bringing personal transformation to people's lives. See, political transformation that only lasts for a decade. You know how we know? Just ask the people in the countries in South America who overthrew their governments and replaced it with a, a government that was just. That justice only lasted for, I don't know, 10 years. And then their new rulers became just as evil as the ones they replaced. Just as totalitarian. Happens over and over and over again. Political unrest that has met with revolution, that revolution only lasts for a time. But Jesus lasts for an eternity. And that's why Jesus spends his time transforming our lives, not the politics of our world. And that is, again, John's disciples are going, Jesus evaluates John's ministry. Don't know whether you heard that. But he said, did you go out to see a man blown by the wind? Of course not. John is not a weak man, shaken by the wind. John wasn't a soft man who delighted in luxuries. John, Jesus says, was the greatest prophet that ever walked the earth. Now, I want you to hold on your hats with that statement. He meant it. Who is John being compared to? Moses. John was greater than Moses. Isaiah. John was greater than Isaiah. Jeremiah, greater than Jeremiah. There is not a prophet who walked upon the earth that was greater than John the Baptist. Yet, did you see how Jesus ended it? The least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than he. That means you. The person watching this video right now, the people here gathered here for worship, every single one of us, myself included, will be greater than John the Baptist was in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the greatness is defined by our relationship with God, not by what we've done. Those who enter the kingdom will be greater still because John, you see, stands on the outside of the kingdom of heaven. Now, we do believe that John is going to heaven. Don't get me wrong. But he still represents the old school. He is the last of the old order who will be heralding the new. But just like Moses who came and brought the people of Israel up to the promised land, he looked in, but he was not permitted to enter it. Same thing with John. John brought people to Jesus right to the edge of the new kingdom. 
but he did not enter it. You are greater than John because you have relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's what we learn. Even the greatest of people experience seasons of doubt, including John the Baptist. I'm going to share a little story some of you may or may not know. Probably 10, 12 years ago, I went through a severe season of doubt. Not just as a pastor, but as a, as a, a Christian. I wasn't sure I believed this stuff anymore. I'm supposed to get up in the pulpit and preach about Jesus. I'm not even sure I believe there was a Jesus. I'm struggling with doubt. I came up to the congregation. I came to the board, and I said to the board, I said, I'm not sure whether I believe this anymore. I'm struggling with this. I don't know what to do with this. We brought it to the congregation. And I, I, they said, let's talk to the congregation about it. We talked to the congregation about it. We talked to the congregation. I said, congregation, I'm wrestling with my faith. I'm not sure I believe this completely. I'm struggling with my faith. And there was a woman who stood up in the congregation loud enough for people to hear. I don't know whether everybody heard it, but I did. She said it to me. She looked me straight in the eyes. She said, Pastor. I said, what? You were there for me when I doubted. And you told me something I'm telling to your face right now. You told me back then, I will have faith for you. Now it's my turn to have faith for you. And we're not kicking you out just because you're struggling. You've never done that to us. I'm a Christian today because of that. Okay? Because people held on to me and had faith for me in my seasons of doubt. We have faith for each other. And in those seasons of doubt, when we have faith for each other, doubt drives us to the pursuit of knowledge and improvement. It's a good thing. We need to stop being freaked out by doubt and thinking like somebody is unfaithful. Doubt can lead to greater faith. If I were a Baptist pastor, I would have been run out of the church. And I'd be, still not be a Christian. But because this church responded in the way of Christ to doubt and embraced me, I had the opportunity to keep walking ahead in my faith. I was surrounded by people who loved me. Doubt is a normal part of the journey of one's faith. And we were surrounded by other people of faith, and we pursue knowledge and improvement, we become ultimately stronger in our faith. Doubt is only troubling if it leads to resignation or blind acceptance. So when in doubt, keep exploring. You know, I'd like to add something to that. Surround yourself with those who have faith for you. Second thing I think we learned for today, like John the Baptist, what Jesus was trying to tell John, do not become too attached to your theology or your understanding of the Bible. What you were taught by your pastor, even by this pastor at some point 10 years ago, 20 years ago, might be wrong. Stop. But some people are so dogmatic about things. I'm a Calvinist. I'm a this. I'm a that. Don't get too attached to your theology. Because God defies our theology. Yes, this is a Bible. Yes, God speaks to us through the Bible. But God is so much bigger than this. God bursts the seams of the Bible. This book cannot contain everything, and so we don't understand it all. And so we get these theologies where we systematize everything. God is bigger than that. we got to stop doing that. 
expect to be surprised by God. Because God truly often defies our understanding. Sometimes we will not understand the full purpose of what God is trying to do and who God is until the very end. In fact, I guarantee you that's true. So if you're going through a season of doubt, good for you. Hold on. Keep walking. Surround yourself with people who have faith for you. Question. Don't accept anything that I tell you or anything any other pastor tells you. If they sit here and say, I'm the authority, listen to me. I'm sorry. Go find another church and another pastor. Because your pastor needs to be more humble and recognize that whatever I preach, it might need to be amended a little at some other point. Because I'm growing, too, in my relationship with God, and so should you. We don't stop. So I'm encouraging you. Doubt when you doubt. Keep wrestling and growing and surround yourself with people who love you and have faith on your behalf. And understand that God is always going to defy everything you ever thought about God because God is so much bigger than you could possibly imagine. Let us pray. Holy Father, we give you thanks again for the bigness and greatness of God that's bigger than we can imagine. I think sometimes we doubt because we think we've got God in a nice little package and then God defies our understanding. It's like, oh, wait a minute. We start to doubt. What we're really doubting is our own understanding. And so I think it's okay to question and doubt. It's a reasonable thing of reasonable human beings. But continue to hold on to us and Send us forth ahead in our faith, despite these doubts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together our song of the day. I love this Advent song, one of the new Advent songs I've been introduced to.
God has made us as people through our baptism into Jesus Christ, trusting in Him, we confess together our faith. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of God the Father, God from God, true God, light, true, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, and according to the scriptures, he ascended to heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the many blessings of this day, but Lord, we understand that there are many who continue to struggle, who worry about their future, who doubt about your presence. We commend to you this day, especially the people of Ukraine, as they struggle and wrestle in their season of great despair. We pray that you would deliver them to freedom. For those who are sick, especially those who struggle with cancer, who wonder what the next day may bring. We pray for a little boy in our church named Mikey, who had a heart attack last night, very scary thing for his parents. And certainly we just don't know whether he walks between life or death. So we just ask you to sustain him and be with his parents this day. We also lift up our, uh, our congregation, our future together, but we lift up as well our Slovak Zion Synod, our Bishop Kucherik. They will be meeting this week at Synod Assembly. We will not be attending as a congregation this year. We are just not able to. But they are certainly covered in our prayer that God would guide and direct their path. The choice of a bishop. The choice of uh, and decisions that need to be made for the future of our Synod as well. Lord, whatever else is on our hearts and minds, we just take a moment of silent prayer to lift these concerns to you because those at home may be struggling with things of which we are unaware. You are welcome to type that in the comments section of the box here today. It may not be prayed for directly today in this worship service. I promise you that I will pray for that. I will also include your concerns in the prayers of the church. We commend the following God to you. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all those for whom we pray, and we trust in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, Amen. who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but to us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his favor peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing together our closing song of the day.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.